You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with journalist and author Rachel Shabby and the Director of Communications at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Annabelle Denham. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. The Sunday Express leads with Boris Johnson saying that joining the Pacific trading bloc will mean lower prices in supermarkets. The Observer's front page has a report that Labour has surged in the polls amid senior Conservatives' fears over Liz Truss's tax cut plans. The Sunday Telegraph leads with a report that Conservative leadership candidate Liz Truss has pledged to halt doctors leaving the NHS to tackle the Covid backlog and surging waiting lists. Wasteminster is the Sunday Mirror headline, with the paper reporting that more than a thousand tonnes of subsidised food has been dumped at Westminster. The Sunday Times reports that university bosses are calling for a tuition fee rise. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Rachel Shabby and Annabelle Denham. Welcome to you both. Let's start with The Observer, first of all. And uh, this surge in the polls for Labour, they're reporting. Uh, Rachel, you take us into this first. Sure. So this is looking at... Um, so, first of all, Liz Truss's fortunes are going down, but concurrently, Labour's are shooting up. So over the last few weeks, I guess, um, what Michael Gove has referred to as, um, you know, Truss being divorced, taking a holiday from reality, and I would say is completely and utterly detached from the reality that most people are living in today. I guess more exposure to that is making people perhaps go off her. But at the same time, um, in the last week, Keir Starmer's own personal ratings, as well as the Labour Party's fortunes, have both dramatically shot up, according to this uh, new poll cited in the Observer as by Servation. And I, I think we can put this down to uh, Starmer's announcement a week ago that energy prices would be capped. And it just shows you, it's just one thing, one little thing. I mean, it is significant, um, this promise to uh, cap energy prices at a time when 45 million people in this country will go into some kind of fuel poverty, according to a survey a few days ago, um, because of the uh, spikes in energy prices. But it is probably worth noting at the same time that while even just that shift has significantly turbo-boosted Labour's fortunes, there is overwhelming public support for renationalization of the big five energy companies. Um, that's according to a, another Servation poll done for We Own It. Um, most Conservative voters, as well as three quarters of uh, Labour Party voters, would back renationalizing energy companies. And it's hard to look at the scale of this crisis, the record profits that these companies are making, basically profiteering off the general public's misery. It's hard to look at that reality and not see that really taking back public control, public ownership, of these energy companies is the best way, not as an not just to fix our immediate crisis, but in the long term as well. Uh, Annabelle, it's probably fair to say that it hasn't helped uh, Liz Truss's fortunes uh, when uh, erstwhile colleagues like uh, Michael Gove, well, a Conservative member and uh, a cabinet member previously, he's saying that her plans to focus on cutting taxes is a holiday from reality. No, certainly that would have been a, a, a knock to her uh, campaign, but it's certainly not going to be a coup de grace. Let's not forget that she has overwhelmingly the support of current cabinet ministers. In fact, I'm not sure that Rishi, Rishi has been endorsed by any uh, current cabinet ministers, at least not since he got down to the final two. I think that Liz Truss is running into some trouble now as beyond cutting taxes, she doesn't really have a solution to addressing the cost of living crisis, the fact that households are going to be really squeezed, uh, particularly as uh, perhaps Liz Truss or perhaps Rishi Sunak like, assume office. This is not a good time to be coming into number 10 Downing Street as prime minister. It's going to be immensely difficult for them um, as well. Um, you know, interesting here how it talks about uh, high-ranking conservatives panicking about 
the Tory prospects at the next general election. Let's not forget that polls have shown that among those who voted Conservative at the last general election, not Conservative uh, members necessarily, but the wider public, Rishi Sunak is more popular. So Liz Truss may get the keys to number 10, but she may struggle to get uh, retain her position come uh, 2024, if indeed that's when the next general election is called. Now, I mean, you can argue that we are currently midterm. We might expect the Tories to be falling behind. But until Partygate, the Tories had never been consistently behind in the polls during this government. They, uh, Boris Johnson and the party, defied political gravity in the way that Tony Blair did. So I don't think we can assume that the Tories are a safe political bet for the next election in the way that we perhaps might have done 12 months ago. Yes, uh, and the, the article points to the fact that two weeks ago, 29% of all voters said Truss would be the best PM against 28% who chose Starmer. Uh, today, Truss has dropped to 23%. Um, let us move on to the Telegraph and have a look at the um, energy cap hitting 6K. Um, that's their front story. Kwesi Kwarteng's planning a crackdown on wind and solar energy profits. That's um, while the, the energy cap is going to hit 6K. Rachel. I mean, I, I find this a, a really obtuse way into the story from the Telegraph. I mean, what we are looking at ultimately is, is eye-watering um, energy prices because the cap has, is, is increasing. Um, it is true that, according to this piece, as this piece says, um, uh, renewables, the price of them is, is just as high because it is currently pegged to electricity and gas prices, so they all go up at the same time. But this, again, seems to me an argument for renationalisation. I mean, that would allow um, the record profits that are made when companies go back into making... So if you take back... If you take back companies into renationalise... If you renationalise the big five, let's say, they wouldn't immediately make a profit because you'd be capping their prices so that people would be able to afford to pay their fuel bills and not fall into destitution or worse, right? But when, when they go back into making a profit, because they're under public ownership, you could then decide, actually, we're going to funnel those profits into renewables. We're going to funnel them into wind sources. We're going to funnel them into other re renewable sources so that you're not, because you're not beholden to shareholders anymore or you know, record um, bonuses to your fat cap bosses. So it completely changes the calibration of the energy equation. And I think that's the story we should be getting at. I'm not really sure I understand what The Telegraph is getting at uh, with this piece. Annabelle, what did you read into the story? Sure. Well, I think that the Conservative government is very much on the wrong course when it, it's looking at these windfall taxes, first on oil and gas companies, the energy profits levy that was announced earlier this year when Rishi Sunak was Chancellor of the Exchequer. And now we have Kwasi Kwarteng, who is uh, picked to be the next Chancellor should Liz Truss uh, be successful in early September. He's now planning a crackdown on wind and solar energy profits uh, as the energy price cap, which uh, the expectations for which seem to be revised upwards and upwards per, per, virtually on a daily basis. Um, now, now, this is not the way to address the, the current energy crisis by uh, taxing these companies and forcing them to operate in increasingly unstable tax regimes. We're going to discourage investment and we're going to prevent new entrants for, from coming into the sector, thereby stifling competition. But nonetheless, this seems to be the path that the Conservatives are going down. I expect that this response, uh, this announcement from the Business Secretary is in part a response response to Keir Starmer's uh, support for freezing prices. Um, certainly, you can see the appeal for that and that it would be simple. It would send a message to consumers that the government has their backs. And this is probably what the business secretary is, is trying to demonstrate. But the problem with freezing prices is that it interferes with price signals. And at the moment, we have a big difference between supply and demand. And we need market signals to, to correct that. Uh, we also have the problem that 
most of the benefit of freezing prices would go to those who are bigger users. This would not be a highly targeted measure. And that's absolutely what the government needs to be looking at because the fi public finances are in a pretty parlous state. So it needs to address how it cushions the blow of soaring energy prices, of rising inflation for the most vulnerable rather than issuing uh, handouts to the public at large. Rachel, to The Observer, and they've got a story about uh, libraries and museums bracing themselves for crowds of people flocking to them to, to keep warm as the winter months approach. Well, that's right. And it's still a, still an energy and heating story. So I do want to respond briefly to what Annabelle just said, because actually it makes absolutely no sense. And the reason we know that is because we can just look across the water to France, where energy is fully nationalised, EDF is fully nationalised, owned by the French public, and energy bills rose just by 4% this year. That's what you're able to do when you control your own energy. Um, but yes, libraries and museums and other public spaces are now looking to be potential places where people who cannot afford to heat their own homes uh, will converge. They will become warm havens to people who can't afford to heat their homes. And the government is being encouraged to push funding in their direction because obviously museums, libraries, etc., are also going to be experiencing huge spikes in um, in energy bills as well. So there's a call there for the government to help them out. But again, this does seem to be we keep scrabbling about for different ways to tackle this problem. Oh, have people go to libraries? Or, you know, another front page story is looking at um, people who switch off their appliances and use smart meters being rewarded for doing so. But these are all like plasters on top of a bleeding, gaping wound. None of this gets to the heart of the problem. The problem at the moment isn't just that energy prices are going up. It's that the companies that are private are running them at extortionate profits. They are spiking their, their rates for their own private gain. That cannot be allowed to happen at a time when you will then have 45 million people plunged into fuel poverty. The answer to that seems to me staring us in the face. Let's just quickly bring Annabelle in. We've just got a few a minute or so, I think, left. Um, is it right that it, it is a, a sticking plaster on a, on a gaping wound to suggest that we heat libraries and, and museums more so people can go there rather than solving the, the initial problem? Yes, certainly. It, that's absolutely the right definition to, to call it a sticking plaster. But look, we have to weather this storm um, over the next 12 months or so until we hope energy prices do begin to come down. Let's not forget that they are in large part down to the uh, conflict in Ukraine. And the government needs to implement measures that are going to protect those who are most vulnerable, perhaps through the benefit system, through income transfers, to help them get through this winter. I don't, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea to be suggesting that people go to areas where they can be warm, even though we don't want to be in a situation where that's required, where we don't want to be in a situation where people are choosing between heating and eating and having to ration the amount of energy that they're using. But, uh, you know, over the longer term, we absolutely need deregulation of the energy sector, which is what we had in the 1990s. We had a massive programme of deregulation and privatisation, and that led to a significant drop in prices for consumers as well as a drop in the amount of emissions, uh, relatively speaking. So that, that's the longer term strategy, but certainly in the short term, I think the government is, is clutching its straws. It's trying to do all it can to perhaps adjust our behavior and, and find places that people can go if they're unable to heat their homes. Okay, Annabelle and Rachel, uh, thank you both. I can see there is a little bit of disagreement there, but I think you, you came round to, to, to agreeing on that, that one point. Um, stay with us, we're gonna take a break uh, more on our press preview, including this story on the front of The Telegraph, their headline, Trust, I'll Halt NHS Doctor Exodus. Do stay with us.
Welcome back. You're watching the press preview. Still with me, journalist and author Rachel Shabby, and the director of communications at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Annabelle Denham. Welcome back to both of you. Let's take a look at the Telegraph uh, front page first of all, uh, Rachel. And the quote is, "I'll halt NHS doctor exodus." This is a quote from uh, Liz Truss. How exactly is she planning to do this? Do we learn in this article? Um, it's a very good question. And to be honest, I'm not sure Liz Truss herself knows the answer. It's <laughs> worth just harking back to the um, the revelation a few days ago that Truss um, co-authored a paper in support of cuts to the NHS and cuts to doctors' pay. So I don't know if by cutting pay she plans to bring more staff back to the NHS. But here she's talking about... Um, rejigging the current rules on pensions mm. so that um that's because because of the pen because pensions are basically there's a safety net around them for doctors correctly i think for nhs staff if they start to earn beyond that um then they'll get taxed tax to the point where they're actually paying to work so i think that's the bit of regulation that she's looking at um it's worth pointing out in this piece it refers to because the NHS is in such a terrible state with, you know, record ambulance response times, record waiting times, um, you know, staff shortages. There's now 1000 excess deaths a week as a result of all that, which is actually more than a number of people um, with deaths due to COVID. So that's quite an eye watering figure in itself. But obviously, if you talk to anyone from the NHS, as opposed to this trust and the regulation slashing fundamentalists that, that she surrounds herself with, they would say um, things like, you know, deal with NHS burnout and stress levels post COVID, increase capacity like bed capacity, increase um, capacity for emergency lines like 911 and 111, um, increase international recruitment, um, invest heavily in mental health. All of those things I would imagine would come up if you actually asked somebody who works in the NHS as opposed to someone who uh, doesn't seem that connected to the reality of the NHS like Liz Truss. Mm. Annabelle, she seems to be suggesting remodelling the, the NHS pension scheme and that being a solution to uh, a senior staff leave, leaving at uh, great rates. Well, certainly I think that that could ease some of the pressures that the NHS is currently facing. I don't think it's a panacea to the fact that we've got over 6 million people on the NHS uh, waiting list. Yeah, so this is Liz Trust. She wants to address the fact that doctors are given this lifetime cap on pensions and are subject to taxes when they make pay, uh, payments that exceed it, which it, it, it's a perversion in, in, the in the tax system. It incentivizes these doctors um, to retire early rather than working for longer. And we know, thanks to that rather alarming report from the Health and Social Care Committee last month, um, that we are, are facing a workforce crisis across health and social care. Um, the research was from the Nuffield Trust um, and found that NHS England is short of 12,000 12, hospital doctors and, and many thousands more nurse, nurses and midwives. Um, I know that the, across the OECD, they're expecting around a 400 thousand doctor shortage by 2030 and that means we're going to be competing internationally to attract more doctors to come here or indeed doctors who've been trained in the UK to stay and work here um, it's, it's, you know so it, as Rachel said it, it, it barely a day passes at the moment without us reading about the NHS being in crisis be it ambulance waiting times be it the number of uh, patients who are dying every week um, and something absolutely needs to be done Done. And this is this is an attempt, one that I would support to uh, at least in part solve Annabelle. the problems facing the NHS. Annabelle, thank you. Sorry, we must leave it there. We've run out of time. Um, thank you both.